Leading indicators point to an economic downturn, and we expect this to be confirmed with excess savings from the pandemic now largely exhausted, the ongoing impact of policy tightening, and the fading of exceptional corporate profits. A full-blown recession, however, is not a foregone conclusion, and our view, rather, is one of a prolonged period of weak growth, what some in the markets called a slow session, as offsetting factors help buffer against a more painful recessionary outcome. Lower inflation is the first of these offsets, leaning against the headwinds of higher unemployment on household purchasing power. Next, the U.S. Inflation Re Reduction Act and the Next Generation EU programs will lend some support to investment even as overall fiscal policy tightens. Turning to real estate, the impact of past monetary policy tightening will mark a headwind to housing along with higher unemployment, but we do not today see the same excess inventory overhang as we saw back at the time of the U.S. subprime crisis. Pockets of commercial real estate, however, are a source of greater uncertainty. While bank credit conditions are indeed tightening, as a fully intended consequence of central bank's monetary policy tightening, an outright credit crunch is again today a far less likely scenario thanks to the much higher level of bank capitalization. To our minds, absent a new global shock, the greatest risk of recession today stems from policy error be it central banks looking too much in the rearview mirror on inflation and failing to ease policy in time, or governments failing to adequately restore balance to public finances. The negative headline inflation number for China in July triggered quite a few headlines talking about deflation. Given that food and energy prices were the main culprits behind the minus 0.3% inflation reading, we would urge some caution in reading this number in isolation as proof of deflation. Looking more broadly today, however, we do see a risk of deflation stemming from the necessary and ongoing debt deleveraging of the Chinese economy. In our central scenario, however, we see targeted policy easing keeping outright deflation at bay. Nonetheless, medium term, the Chinese economy is set to see more moderate growth rates of around 4%. The impact for the rest of the world, however, will come not so much from the slowdown of Chinese growth, but rather from the composition hereof. When China first opened up its economy, now several decades ago, the export engine drew in intermediary goods from the rest of the world. Over time, China's exporters saw a higher domestic content, but at the same time, its tremendous investment boom offered a new source of demand for global capital goods. The growth of the Chinese consumer class was a further positive, but consumption is likely to become more domestically sourced with ever-growing quality of Chinese products. In particular, those emerging economies that derive substantial benefits from the past Chinese growth engines will now have to look to new sources of growth. Moreover, China's leading position in the green manufacturing and in supply of the minerals necessary for the energy transition will mark an important competitive force globally. <music>